Welcome everyone to today's panel discussion, which is entitled Clinical Coding and SNOMED uh, CT. Uh, my name is Simon Wallace and I'm the CCIO for Nuance uh, Communications. Um, earlier this year, Nuance held a roundtable event to discuss the challenges coders faced, bringing together senior figures from across the UK uh, NHS, two of whom I'm delighted to say today we have with us on the panel. Uh, and we're looking at highlighting possible solutions and what the future role may look like for the coder. Uh, we published a report detailing this roundtable alongside uh, a series of recommendations. Uh, and this report is available to download from the Nuance uh, virtual booth. Um, today's panel discussion builds on this theme and we plan to explore a number of areas. The changing role uh, in the UK NHS of the coder over the next uh, 10 years, um, the impact of SNOMED CT on that role, and finally, what is needed to future-proof that role to ensure that it is capable of anticipating, meeting, and exceeding demands on healthcare informatics uh, moving uh, forward. Well, so much to cover, and without further ado, let me introduce our uh, distinguished panelists and ask them to say a few words about themselves. Um, and let me start. Uh, Michael Jones, say a little bit about yourself, please. Hi, everyone. So I'm Michael Jones, Associate Director of Education at the Institute of Health Records and Information Management. Um, we are one of the main professional bodies that represent health informatics professionals in the UK and also provide a range of qualifications, most notably the National Clinical Code and Qualification UK, which we've offered for around about the past 20 years. Um, I have a background of working as a clinical coder in both the NHS and independent sector in the UK and for around about the past five years have worked as an internal auditor providing NHS organisations with a range of audit assurance and advice services covering the uses of classifications and coded clinical data. Uh, I sit on a number of advisory boards including the Professional Record Standards Body and Royal College of Physicians. Uh, in January of this year, I was extremely privileged to be able to share the roundtable discussion uh, with, which you once hosted uh, to get some of those answers about the future of clinical coding in the digital health service and the role that technology can play. Thank you, Michael. Um, our next uh, panellist is Jill Cartledge. Jill, don't worry about yourself, please. Hi, everyone. I'm Jill Cartledge. I'm the Head of Coded Data and Standards Assurance at the Northern Care Alliance, which is a large NHS group organisation in the UK. I'm Senior Manager in the Informatics and Business Intelligence team, and I head up a small team um, providing specialist assurance of coded data. I've got over 20 years as an experienced clinical coder. I'm also a qualified auditor, um, and I'm currently studying the SNOMED International Implementation course as I regularly provide technical advice to our digital electronic patient record team as part of my role. Thank you, Jill. Um, next, uh, Michael Bond. Over to you, sir. Hi, um, I'm Michael Bond. I'm a, a clinical informatics manager within NHS Digital, working within information representation services. So that includes the National Release Centre for the SNOMED in the UK. Um, I've been working for the last 10 years in implement standards development and implementation, uh, working on a, a variety of uh, projects in that time. Um, and it, within the National Release Centre, I was um, previously tasked with working with reference data, so subsets and ref sets um, on, on a, a regular release schedule. Um, so I'm still a registered nurse, so as a clinician, I can uh, have first-hand experience of using uh, digital records in the field as well as implementation experience. Thank you, Michael. We have a fourth panelist, Bevan Manoy. We're going to be hearing from him um, in the uh, Q&A session uh, at the end. Um, so let's start with a little bit of scene setting um, and say a couple of words about um, SOMED CT terminology and other classifications such as um, um, ICD-10. Um, Michael Bond, I, I wonder if you could give us a little bit of insight from um, the policy perspective to get us going. Okay, well, just really it's important you understand the difference between the terminology and the classification. Um, they, they both have their uh, their uses, their purpose, and uh, and and they are they're not in conflict. 
So a terminology and SNAM SCT is, is uh, our, our most poignant case um, is for direct patient care. So it's for use in electronic records principally um, for um, uh, it's based upon an, an open world paradigm. In other words, you say what you see to be true from a clinical point of view. But key thing, it's for direct patient care. So classifications, um, uh, by contrast, then, are for population statistical analysis. Um, for So it's for secondary uses, and it's based upon um, a whole event um, a completed episode rather than for um, at a given point in time for care. So the other important thing to notice about classifications is they're based on a closed world paradigm because like all the good accounting practices you have to account for everything. Um, so you have to have little buckets of other or not elsewhere classified to make sure you've accounted for everything. So yeah, classifications are an international requirement. We have to be able to compare like with like internationally. So the World Health Organization uh, require us to use uh, classifications. Um, and whereas it's it's um, it's useful though to have a more detailed, uh, structured terminology to support r uh, the richness of record keeping and allows um, to support things like decision support um, and, and also the greater detail then when you come to a, uh, analyze it both for clinical improvement, for um, service improvement and, and possibly even then for commissioning as well. Well that, that, thank you, that, that's a really um, good overview. Jill maybe we could uh, go down to the hospital trust level. Um, from your perspective um, what does that mean? Well, thank you, Michael. I think that was a really great overview of the differences. Um, so from a trust perspective, I think the implementation of SNOMED affords real opportunities and benefits to the clinical coding profession. And, and we know that it in no way seeks to replace the vital role that those coders do. Um, I think in the UK, the coders have undertaken their role alongside challenges over the years of poor quality record keeping in paper health records which often become confused and conflicting over time. As we move to a digitized record, the implementation will provide structure to the records with the use of common language. And whilst in the short term, this will mean little change for the role of the coders, the longer term advances will bring opportunities for more automation and they will complement the current manual extraction processes. The concept-centric design of the terminology means that it's focused on representing clinical meanings and in turn the coders will benefit from seeing much more meaningful health records and that will increase the availability of the relevant information they require to undertake their roles. Okay, well so thank you Joe. I think it's really important that to get uh, that high-level overview um, into perspective. So let's let's go on and drill down into uh, SNOMED CT itself. And um, I'd like to ask, uh, to what extent um, has SNOMED CT been implemented um, in the UK? And I'd like to ask each one of you to share some of the successes, but also some of the challenges um, with uh, SNOMED CT. Um, and Michael Bond, uh, again, I wonder if I could ask you to kick off and set the scene from a national perspective, if you would. Okay, so so just to be clear, I can speak from um, an England perspective um, rather than the whole of the UK. Um, but a lot of what we're doing in England also is being uh, followed up rapidly by Wales and, and Scotland as well. So um, within um, our remit with NHS Digital, um, certainly there's been a massive program of work to implement SNOMED CT within general practice systems, so primary care your general practitioners there, um, who were by and large uh, using uh, a um, legacy systems for coded information, but they've made the transition then to SNOMED CT. Um, we're using it for the summary care record in England in terms of um, key extracts of data from the GP system into a shareable uh, view of 
uh, the, the summary information that's useful, and this has been particularly helpful uh, and have been greatly accelerated during the COVID pandemic, we're able to, to share pertinent information through the summary care record. And then we're looking at um, a lot of, uh, of um, uh, programs of work to uh, drive the implementation of SNOM NCT through data collections. Um, good example, emergency care data set, which is really a collection data set, but it's trying to collect information as it was rec would have been recorded at point of care. So SNOM NCT is, is entirely pertinent for that. So that's driven the use of SNOM NCT in emergency care. Uh, digital child health, large program of work there for sharing key information about events um, through child development, um, key things like vaccinations, um, assessments of development, and so on. Uh, more recently, the uh, there has been a, um, again, two-pronged approach with maternity. There's a data set which collects NMTT from the record and also a record standard which says how it should be captured at point of care. Uh, mental health, again, great, great uh, developments there in capturing NMTT in the record and then for secondary uses. But a, a lot of these, the drivers are for actually for secondary uses. Um, and that's the way uh, in which um, NHS Digital is, has been able to uh, ma mandate the collection and therefore uh, the uh, recording at point of care. That has its problems in that there's a bit of a knock-on effect because NHS Digital um, can't directly mandate um, suppliers to use NMOTT. That's uh, the responsibility of the providers of care so they, they're the ones who, under a standard NHS contract, should be asking for uh, the system suppliers to be using SNOMA TT for point of care. So there is a bit of a, okay. uh, a delay, a ripple effect, if yeah. you will, but there is some progress. Thank you. So it sounds like quite a, quite a lot going on there. Um, why don't we, um, if I go to uh, our second Michael, Michael Jones, uh, I wonder if you could, um, Give us some insight into how you've seen SNOMED progressing uh, in the acute sector, um, and particularly um, in, in, in hospitals. And any examples you may be able to give? Uh, yeah, sure. So I think you know, as we've discussed, we've seen that there's been widespread implementation across primary care, but we have to acknowledge that the uptake in secondary care has been less. You know, outside of some of the specific examples which, which, which Michael has mentioned, such as the emergency care data set, um, you know, we haven't really seen a lot of provider organisations doing the full SNOMED implementation, um, which, which is what the ask has been. You know, health and care providers were required to go paperless as of the point of April this year. Um, but we know that in practice that that hasn't really happened. You know, most trusts are still progressing along on the sort of digital roadmap, if you like, and that includes procuring the relevant IT systems which are needed to support this change. Um, you know, SNOMED was first mandated back in 2003, but for me as someone working in a position inside an acute trust, it still feels rather uncertain, you know, as, as, as to where, to whether even SNOMED CT is really a key consideration in a lot of trust, um, you know, plans going forward. Um, certainly from the information standards notice point of view, a lot of that is focused on interoperability between systems, so getting messaging between primary and secondary care and, you know, extraction of data out of EPRs. But I feel that there's, you know, a multitude of benefits to having SNOMED, you know, embedded into your clinical systems that may be currently being overlooked by providers, um, you know, thinking of it more in terms of requirements rather than opportunities. Um, but that being said, there are examples of some trusts that have decided to really move ahead with this, although it's largely driven by sort of pockets of innovation rather than any kind of widespread change. Um, one such example is um, the Rob Room NHS Foundation Trust. Um, they implemented an EPR with content captured for direct care using SNOMED uh, quite a few years ago now. Um, the, the trust mainly uses it in the accident um, and emergency department, their outpatient settings. Um, it is used in inpatients, but it, it, it's a rather more limited utilization. So for like outpatients, they use it for recording diagnoses and procedures, 
um, which is a really good benefit for them because given that, you know, historically in England we've not coded outpatient diagnoses, there's been no requirement for us to do that. So that provides them as a trust with a really rich source of clinical information, which they can then leverage. Um, they managed to get in about 95% of their outpatient procedures mapped using SNOMED and, and that's how they code them. So that, you know, is a reduced burden to the administrative um, workforce. Coding of outpatients in, in England is quite uh, quite patchy, really. Um, some trusts that is managed from within the core clinical coding function and, and in others, it's kind of more pushed out to the directorate to do themselves and, and they might get support from a clinical coding team to help bring up a performer or whatever, but a lot of the input is done by non-specialist, non-trained staff. So, so there are considerable risks to data quality there. If you ever do any kind of audit yeah. about patient coding, there's a lot of either over or under recording or just plainly incorrect coding. So having the use of the terminology right. and, and, and assured mappings has really you know, benefited them there in terms of their accuracy. Um, okay. Similarly, okay. So there's been some activity. Sorry, there's been some activity, but some uh, so, so a, a lot more to do. Um, let, mm -hmm. let me let me move on to to Jill, if I may. Um, and I wonder if you can shed any light on any lessons learned where such implementations um, have taken place at all. Yeah, of course. So I'm going to take us back three years um, to a data set that was mentioned by um, both Michaels. So back in October 2017 in the UK, the emergency care data set was implemented with an aim of improving levels of data about emergency care, um, levels of information that we'd never collated consistently before. And, and we wanted to use that to improve patient care, um, having more consistent information and improving communication between health professionals. So SNOMED CT is used throughout the data set to record a number of data items. Um, and when I go back to 2017, implementation was a real challenge for us. Um, never before experienced a mid-financial year data set change um, in my time. Um, and, and we're a trust with a mature electronic patient record. Um, and and we've been almost steps ahead of this. So in previous years, we've migrated all our paper traditional documentation into the electronic patient record. And, and we've done that in-house, so it wasn't an off-the-shelf um, software. So we developed that, and therefore we had to develop a user interface to help record and capture this data for the data set. Now, the data set actually uses an intentionally restricted range of terms for the diagnosis set. And, and we didn't really gain our clinician support around this. Previously, we have given them a, a much wider, much granular set of over 2,000 terms that they would select from, and that was actually already in SNOMED. Um, so we had to wind that back. Um, therefore, they felt that we were moving away from supporting the patient care to actually doing a data collection. So we're very much changing focus of what we were doing. We had to develop um, the solution at speed, and we had uh, several versions over a short space of time um, to address errors. Um, in the technical output spec of the data set. So whilst the aim was to increase data, we actually lost granularity um, and, and that focus really changed. Now, when we look back three years on, as we have more experience of implementations, um, there are possibly other routes that we could have taken with this and different options and probably could have had a more seamless um, information system where we utilize the structure of SNOMED and use those is a relationship um, where we perhaps could have uh, implemented something actually within our data warehouse which would have mapped those codes which wouldn't have impacted um, the frontline clinicians. We did have access during the process to clinical champions uh, and they were absolutely key to getting buy-in but they lacked that experience of local solutions um, and therefore, we, we were almost left alone to come up with our own way of implementing. Um, and I think that um, really impacted how we've progressed with that. And um, Michael Jones touched on it. And we've actually implemented as a requirement rather than touching on the opportunities that we could have gained from collecting this data in a very different way to, to how we've previously done that. Um, 
so there were other challenges also. So we had lack of resource um, with that SNOMED expertise within our digital teams. Um, and at, at the start, it was very much seen as a one-off development. Um, and it wasn't clear from the start that there would be a future maintenance to that. Um, um, so that, that's been really different. And whilst um, clinical right. coders don't traditionally have that role um, of working with AD data, um, it actually did impact how we do um, our admitted patient care data. The coders suddenly saw um, data being recorded within the record in a different way. They didn't have the experience of um, action qualifiers being used with a diagnosis. So seeing terms such as the um, confirmed diagnosis or suspicion of a diagnosis actually was very different to, to the traditional data that they would normally work with. So um, we did have right. to do um, some awareness with the coders um, and, and we had to make changes in the system because um, it wasn't so clear at first within the user interface which of the actual qualifiers were used and we knew that um, diagnoses in ED that were just suspicious were actually impacting how we coded right. the onward admission. So um, whilst right. they didn't have um, a, a responsibility for the ED captures themselves, it did really impact how we do our coding. So I think that just highlights how important awareness yeah. and collaboration is across teams. So, so Jill, quite a, quite a few uh, lessons learned there. I suppose that's a nice segue into our, our second topic, really which is around the role that perhaps technology could play, um, artificial intelligence, um, what impact uh, that could have um, on clinical coding going forward. Um, and, and let me start um, by asking Michael, Michael Bond, um, just your views on the role of technology uh, and AI and, and how you feel that could um, play a role. Um, a couple of minutes, if you wouldn't mind. Okay. so. Um, certainly, as I say, if this is about um, looking at tr the traditional clinical or uh, narrative where a lot of things have been written in beautiful flowing prose, it's about um, adding um, the, the richness of data um, into that narrative. Now, there's, there's a variety of ways you can do that by um, by using natural language processing, pattern matching, so on and so forth. Um, it, it obviously helps if you have an electronic record to start off with. Um, but the, the value of, of using small CT possibly as a, as a stepping stone um, is, is the fact that you can add value quite quickly to um, key phrases, key, key uh, recorded elements of the record. Um, and, and that then, can um, aid as a, a almost as a halfway house really before you then go on to, to, to further pattern matching um, uh, using or it's augmented intelligence artificial intelligence call it what you will uh, that the the ability to glean information from the raw data you present it now um, I mean I, I'm absolutely clear as, as I think all, all the other panelists have mentioned this is not going to replace uh, the the uh, knowledge and skills of the coders in their role here. This is about trying to get as much information as we can out of the the clinical narrative as it's currently collected. Um, it, it also, I think, it's important that we we go beyond, way beyond, just capturing the diagnosis um, and the procedures that are carried out. It's about having all those other um, axes are these important in bits of information um, for example there's uh, within the emergency focusing on emergency care as an example of implementation um, we're now looking at capturing the the, the national early warning uh, score uh, and that's going to be things which aren't diagnoses they are things you find but are coded um, along the way and, and that is um, tells us or we know we have examples where AI are, uh, is picking up um, patterns of, of data that give clinical meaning to things we wouldn't have had the ability to pick out had we been using a classification 
um, approach because of the classification typically is too broad. We need that granularity and detail and, and the value yeah. that having a structured terminology can bring. Yeah. So it sounds like it's going to be uh, an evolving uh, beast, Michael, um, over time. Uh, Jill, I wonder if I come to you next and uh, perhaps take a look at the area of, of, of data mining. I wonder if you could share um, your experience here and, and give an example. And, and again, in a couple of minutes, if you wouldn't mind, please. Absolutely. Um, so back in March 2020, I think it's still um, very um, in, in all of our minds, but who declared the COVID-19 pandemic? And back in March, the NHS actually were asked to identify patients who were at high risk of COVID, um, and we were to ensure that these patients should be shielded. The identification for inclusion required interrogation and analysis of multiple national data sets, one of which um, has so the um, hospital episode statistics. Um, but would that be enough alone? No, it wouldn't. Um, so currently in the UK, there's no national mandate, uh, and we've touched on this, to diagnosis information, um, and, and that isn't submitted to SUS. So um, it was it's really difficult to identify these patients. So what could we do locally at our trust to ensure that our most vulnerable patients have been identified? So very fortunate at, at my trust, we already have an established science team in place. Um, and had already been working on project projects using data mining. So a decision was made that we'd use this form of artificial intelligence to apply this to the shielded patient risk stratification methodology, particularly in rheumatology, as those patients are more prevalently treated in an outpatient setting. So um, what we did, we analysed over 68,000 letters and we processed those um, those letters covered 18,000 patients, so multiple letters for each patient over time. Um, and we passed those letters um, through the software in bulk to normalise to SNOMED CT. We couldn't have identified those patients from coded data alone. The, the, the data needed to apply that methodology was beyond the scope of the classification. What we needed to do were identify patients of certain diagnoses, the patients who had certain comorbidities, and key to that, um, the patients who were on um, immunosuppressive medications and biologic drugs. So using the technology, we actually managed to um, identify a thousand of our patients that needed to be notified um, to be shielded. Um, and, and I think that was a piece of work that we'd, we'd kind of stepped into the technology um, previously, but a very sort of rapid um, response to that request back in March, um, we turned this around really quickly. And I think that just shows the benefit of having an electronic patient record um, and using artificial intelligence to be able to data mine and identify cohort patients. Um, for what for whatever reason, so I think that is a, a really kind of like relevant example for where we are at the moment in the pandemic, um, and an example of yeah. how we could have done that across multiple specialties, um, and and um, the results of that and the work that we did with the University of Manchester on this, um, we've now been able to extend uh, data mining across a number of our other specialties. Um, so it's really quite yeah. exciting time. Yeah. Yeah, really interesting. I, you know, with the second wave on its, uh, you know, on its way, you know, that experience is probably going to hold you in very good stead um, for other other sort of data mining initiatives you may well uh, need to do. And I'm sure there may well be some questions about that coming forward um, a bit later on. Um, thank you for that. Um, finally, um, Michael, Michael Jones, um, I wonder if we could uh, jump aboard um, your time machine, if we may, and travel into the future. Um, and what changes do you see coming down the track um, with uh, technology and AI? So I suppose like the starting point really would be in, you know, organizations implementing electronic patient records, you know, and, and there are benefits to having a well-structured EPR. You know, there are benefits to clinical coding, not only, you know, through implementation of SNOMED into those electronic patient records to enable clinicians to capture that informa information, you know, th that can then be, you know, auto you know, we can put in semi-automation to map some of that SNOMED content into classification codes. 
this can you know pr provide a, a good start of the term for coders it can you know highlight some of the uh, pertinent conditions and procedures that that might be relevant to the to the actual coding of of that particular patient record um the implement you know in terms of a snowman implementation we already talked about that interoperability and that ability to to you know share information between care settings so actually in in allow in enabling that we could reduce some of that duplication of work so you know currently we code um hospital admissions on an episodic basis so each time we rely on clinicians to repeat that same past medical history to redocument a lot of comorbidities and things so that coders can then code them to the current episode by having that interoperability by having perhaps some messaging from the GP or from the care home to the hospital that could be populated into the electronic patient record without requiring that duplicated effort from the clinician. Um, so, so, so there are some exciting things there. I'm also aware that you know NHS Digital were, were actually working on a project um, to explore the feasibility of deploying a natural language and processing pipeline and investigating how that could support clinical coders by assigning SNOMED as well as classification codes to uh, the clinical text. So, you know, we're, we're thinking of SNOMED in terms of, you know, um, as, as, a, as a concept and, and, and a coded sort of e entity, but clinicians will still want to write a clinical narrative. They'll still want to have free text. And you can see a proliferation of documents within an EPR. You know, some patient and hospital admissions can have thousands of different documents. So actually utilizing the power of, of, of technology like NLP could actually help to reduce some of that workload rather than having to manually go through all of the documents by it actually tagging certain terms and again, flagging these up to the coder as, as, as things that would be pertinent. Um, so, so yeah, so, so this is a lot of opportunity in, with, with technology and, and yeah. how to develop. So, so lots of exciting things ahead, um, but one of, our, one of our real themes, wasn't it, um, is what it means for the clinical coding role. And I think for our third uh, topic, um, I'd like to sort of um, address this in a, a little bit uh, more uh, detail, um, what that means. So how do you think the changes we've highlighted so far, so we've talked about um, uh, the implementation of SNOMED CT and we've had a little bit of a, a look at uh, the role of technology. What impact is this going to have on the role of the uh, coder, do you think? And Jill, can I ask you to kick us up on this one, please? Absolutely, yeah. Um, so the Personalised Health and Care 2020 endorses the move to adopt the single ter clinical terminology to support direct care, and we touched on that um, at the start of this presentation. Um, it enables cross-sector interoperability, however, it is not the direct replacement for current administrative processes, such as those underpinned by clinical coding. All three NHS information standards, of which so MedCT, ICD-10, and OP OPCS, are a national requirement, and they are complementary to each other. Clinical coders will still be required to classify information derived from the patient record. And, and just to put that into perspective, that's over 19 million inpatient episodes a year in the UK. Um, it's no less an exciting opportunity for the coding professional. Um, it, to be part of, of transforming that patient record, um, embracing future technologies which can enhance the current processes within clinical coding, Utilising those cross mappings um, from the clinical information into the ICD-10 codes, it will assist the coders in accurate and timely assignment of codes using that structured information in the record. But it's not a fully automated um, process. The coders will still be needed to validate those cross maps. They'll still be required to use their knowledge and their training in the application of the classification rules and standards. Um, but clinical coders have got some great skills. They've honed their softer skills over the years. They've had to. Um, whilst they've been working with their clinical colleagues to improve the quality of the data in the record and support that coding process. And with the development of their own personal snow med CT skills, they'll be able to undertake those advisory roles in work to improve data quality, work closely with the clinicians, and ensure that those clinical observations and findings and procedures are all recorded accurately within the patient record. So um, investment in that collaboration at the point of care will just 
proved to become so fruitful for the coders over the years and really exciting ways of working. So it does just so many benefits. Um, so for me, um, I think, you know, coders investing in the future is investing in their SNOMED knowledge. Um, and, and, you know, um, it, it's really exciting. I've been in coding a long time and I think we've waited a long time for this to start to happen. Well, that's, that, that's very positive and very encouraging, uh, Jill. Thank you. Uh, Michael, Michael Jones, threat or no threat, all this SNOMED CT stuff and um, AI? Um, so it's absolutely not a threat. Um, so, so in my view, you know, currently the roles and responsibilities of, of, of clinical coding professionals are, are largely similar across, you know, all the trusts in, in, in England. I mean, we see a lot of variation in, in job titles and remuneration um, across organisations, but essentially the technical skills that are required are, are the same. But I think, you know, the opportunity here is that the coder's role can be greatly improved by good utilization of technologies like SNOMED uh, or NLP. Uh, you know, it can help to improve the quality of the medical record sources with which the coders are working and can provide assistance to them by identifying some of the terms which may be, you know, pertinent to that coding process. Um, and it may be that the coding of some of that simple activity can be reliably automated. You know, there will always be checks and validations that will be needed, but, you know, that can allow the coders to focus, you know, their time and their training, you know, on those more complex cases. So I think, you know, what we'll see is a more sort of harmonization of clinical coding role with data quality and, and information assurance. Um, and I think, you know, coders are in a very unique position to identify discrepancies in the medical record and then to flag these up to clinicians for review. So I think it's really about them seeing this as an opportunity to build on the existing knowledge that they have, the medical terminology, human you know, anatomy and physiology, the data definitions and, and, and hospital services you know, to support more accurate information capture. And of, of course, part of that correct use of, um, of SNOMED CT. So I think you know, coders need to learn and develop the knowledge of this new technology. They, they need to increase the level you know, of accuracy achieved through um, semi-automation. You know, they need to understand those processes. Um, you know, and eventually that will lead to increased efficiency and allow them more time to do the quality improvement work, such as the audit and the assurance and training. Um, I mean, Jill's already touched on it, but the need for SNOMED specialism in trusts is essential and will enable appropriate, you know, training and support. You know, appropriately skilled clinical coders can fulfill that function. You know, they, they can take on that role and be an important contact for clinicians, but also other non-clinical users of the terminology, for example, for example, data analysts. So, you know, currently analysts require support from coders in identifying the right codes that they need to complete their queries. Uh, you know, so as trusts start to amass data recorded in SNOMED, inevitably, inevitably they'll want to leverage that. Uh, you know, but that will require an understanding of SNOMED content to actually achieve. Um, you know, and as well knowing when it's appropriate to use SNOMED for a query versus when using a classification. So, so there is a role, you know, for someone to step in with this kind of developed specialist knowledge. Um, and I think the codes are okay. in the right place and, and can be working even more closely with all kinds of stakeholders about right. that in the future. Yeah. So I think I'm hearing from both of you um, a, a real opportunity. Um, finally, Michael Bond, are you going to muddy the waters here? Or are you thumbs up or thumbs down for the future? What's, what's your view, sir? Oh, yeah, future's bright, as they say. No, I, absolutely. I, I think you've covered it off fairly well between you two. Um, yes, it's about improving data quality. Um, it should be about supporting the clinicians. I mean, they shouldn't be the ones who have to worry about um, you know, what's behind the record. They just want to record what they need to record for the point of care. So yes, there will be uh, a need to support data quality. It's about audit. As you say, it's about looking at the complex cases uh, and making sure that that's accurate, accurately recorded and therefore accurately coded so that we know what's gone on. Um, we know that um, the NHS uh, data collection machine is, uh, um, it, it's got a, a wider turning circle than your average oil tanker. 
um, and takes five years or more to, to make any sort of degree of turn. So yes, we're going to be using coding for the foreseeable future to look at the way a tariff works, the way that our reporting systems work. But that is um, completely, there's complete um, uh, need and justification for uh, the clinical coding is profession. The future is bright. The education is out there. I mean, I will, I will plug the the, the Snowbird International um, education uh, 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 offerings that they have. Um, so look at snowmed.org. Get yourself on the foundation course as a minimum if you're a coder. Um, it's it's all good stuff and will only add uh, strength to your professional position. So yeah, all good. Right. Well, so thank you, thank you, Van. Thank you for all three. It sounds a, a very much thumbs up, um, glass half full um, future. So uh, that, that that's very good to hear. Um, I'd like to draw our discussion to a close, if I may, with just to get your um, each of you your your final thoughts. Uh, in um, our roundtable report that we did um, and published, and there'll be a slide with a link to that on. You can you can also get it from um, the Nuance page as well. There were there were a number of um, key recommendations um, for the UK um, NHS. Now I, I know we have a um, an international audience, but I think um, I'd, I'd like to end by asking each of our panelists to build on one or some of those recommendations with a key important takeaway for today uh, that you would like to leave with um, our audience. Um, I'm going to start ladies first, uh, Jill. Um, could you just give us a, a brief sum up in a couple of minutes of where you think we are? Absolutely. Um, so clinical coding um, in the UK, often it's been seen as a back office function. Um, we're labelled as admin and clerical staff. Um, but over the years, we've worked really, really hard to promote the work of, of what are health informatics professionals. And we've done that through professional qualifications, CPD, professional registration. Um, but the coders are still faced with challenges due, um, on a daily basis due to the variation in sources of documentation used both locally and nationally. Um, advances in electronic health records and the information of SNOMED as we said, is a great opportunity for the coders to demonstrate those transferable skills and their knowledge um, and move away from that culture of it's coded wrong that we hear so often. Um, it's vital that the coding staff no longer accept substandard information and they need to take a responsibility for that. So my key message that I would um, give you to, to you today to take away is that it is really, really essential that the coders are involved in any implementation plans at a trust level um, to ensure that electronic patient records and other information systems are fit for that purpose that support the vital coding role in healthcare data. Um, they've got so much knowledge, they're in a, such a privileged position that they see such a variety of documentation across special um, across multi, um, they have real insight to that recording practice in the record. So um, please do involve them and invite them along to be part of your EPR development. Um, and, and that's not a one-off. That needs to be um, a, a role that is, is really um, taken on board um, for the long term as those records start to develop. So a, a real change of mindset required, but a, a very very positive outcome if um, hospitals and organisations take it. Thank you, Jill. Um, let's move on. Uh, Michael Jones, your, your final thoughts, please. Um, okay. So I suppose what what I, I, I would argue for is that you know really what we need to see is is some sort of updated training for coders. And and when I say this, I, I don't just mean in terms of what is offered nationally. I actually genuinely do believe that the, the clinical coding training that we have in the UK is actually of a very good quality. But what I mean is that the need, we need to look at what other training is relevant to this, you know, progression of the role and provide clear links to the sort of skills and the technologies which are going to be essential for in the future. Um, so I think, you know, really with respect to that, what we need is a clear and consistent framework outlining the competencies which will be required for these, you know, changing roles. You know, in the UK, the government has a digital uh, data and technology framework which looks at uh, 
similar roles and outlines the required skills and, and looks, you know, career pathways for that. And I think, you know, the health analytics community in the UK are certainly looking at how they can adopt that kind of approach. And I think we need to be thinking about how that can be applied to clinical coding roles too, as, as well in the future, you know, where we have, you know, skills that are developed in line, you know, with clearly described roles. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think, you know, in terms of looking forward to the future, that is definitely what I would like, um, you know, the focus to kind of be on. Um, but in terms of, you know, what, what the coders can kind of do now, it's, I would just simply encourage them to embrace the potential for change, you know, and ask to be counted as a health informatics professional. You know, there's, a, there's an increased focus on data now more than there has ever been. You know, I think we've all seen this over the past six months. Um, and there's a real buzz in the informatics you know, and digital professions, you know, in the UK, particularly within the health sector. Um, but I often feel that clinical, the clinical code and profession isn't as engaged in all of this as it really should be. And we therefore run that risk of becoming the orphan tribe if we do nothing. So I would perhaps just reiterate kind of what Jill's comment has been and say, you know, yes, get involved. Nothing about us without us, because, you know, if, if, we're not, if we don't have that seat at the table, then it doesn't matter, you know, how relevant you think your role will be, you know, it, it, it will kind right. of drift off to the sides of it. So, so I, I just think, you know, just get engaged, be open to the possibility of change and, you know, and start to look into getting some of that education, getting some of that training and, and, and upskilling yourself. And, and that, that's my main message. Yeah, I, I, I hear a bit of, I hear a bit of carpe diem, seize the day there, I think, Michael. Um, thank you for that. Um, and finally, but not least, um, Michael Bond, um, some closing thoughts from you um, from our discussion today. Yeah, well, fairly succinctly then, if I may. Education, education, education. Somebody else may have said that before, but it's still true. Um, whether it's education of clinicians to understand it, it's your record. <laughs> you know, it's your record. You need to understand what you put in there. Education for the people providing, responsible for providing the services. You've got to be able to have a system that can deal with it. Suppliers, education, understand what you have to record. Education for the coders who then have to interpret this. And it's not all down to them. They've got a big enough job as it is. But education, use what we have. It's good quality. It's free, as I understand it, at the, uh, from snowmed.org. Go take it up. Go do it. Okay, well, uh, what a positive note um, to finish on, and uh, thank you very much. Um, I, I'd like to thank our three panelists, Michael Jones, Jill Cartledge, and Michael Bond, um, for sharing uh, their expertise with us today, and thank you uh, for the audience uh, for joining us. Um, we hope that you've all um, had some uh, valuable insight and learnt some uh, lessons. Um, I've mentioned the report a couple of times. You can see the slide on screen uh, where you can get um, hold of that. Um, and we're now going to switch over to a Q&A session. So uh, just bear with us. Um, from all, Myself, from the three panelists, um, we're going to say um, au revoir, but be with you in uh, just a short while for a live Q&A session. Well, I hope uh, everyone enjoyed uh, that uh, session we had, and we have a few minutes left now for um, some Q&A. Um, and you've all been fantastic. We've had uh, lots of interesting questions uh, come through the chat. Uh, so thank you with that. So um, what I'm going to do is uh, uh, select a few um, and put them to our panelists, and um, uh, we'll take it from there. Uh, the first one is, is around medical education, actually, and uh, I've got good memories of uh, uh, seeing a senior consultant in a hospital have what was called a coding ward round, where uh, he would um, have his junior doctor with him and someone from the coding department, and they would go through um, all the patients that were in for the week, and they would together um, share their knowledge and, and put um, uh, co appropriate codes around it. Um, and he called it the, uh, the coding ward round. Um, let me ask um, Jill, if I may, uh, a question from uh, Inga Soons, should education on clinical coding have a place in uh, medical facilities? Well, I think that's probably a given, but in, in what way do you think? Um, so, yes, absolutely, it, it, it does have a place, and, and to my knowledge, it does have a current place there. Um, 
I think the education needs to be pitched at the appropriate level um, and it needs to be go ongoing throughout medical training and actually ongoing. Um, so, um, for example, we, we've just been invited along um, to contribute to a, to a master's model um, in Manchester, um, which is um, a module about enhancing clinical skills. Um, and, and we'll be doing quite an in-depth um, education around coding, around the structure of coding and those uses. So, absolutely has a place. Um, but it's got to be pitched at an appropriate level. Um, I think um, it's a really good opportunity to um, influence how um, particularly junior staff may document in the record, um, but also to give them that understanding of how that would be interpreted by a coder and how that would be then used um, in statistics or um, other um, uses of coded data like mortality indicators. Um, so it's a real opportunity, and I think the ward round you discussed is something that probably pre-COVID um, coders throughout the UK were contributing to, um, maybe in different um, guises, but um, it's certainly something that I, I think a lot of coders do. Um, I think most coding departments deliver modules on inductions. Um, again, that can be um, done with the juniors, but also for new consultants into the organisation. I think it's really important um, that, that you then kind of pitch that at a different level and um, to in enhance their learning around coding. So, yes, absolutely does have a place, um, from my opinion. Okay. Um, that, that's great, and, and, it, and it's what, of course, the clinicians get, uh, they're going to get out of it as well, and that could be part of that education process. Um, I've got a, uh, my next question um, is uh, from uh, Richard uh, Burden, if I may. Um, it, it's about um, uh, do you think increasing the implementation of SNOMED CT in, U in the UK supports the full implementation of ICD 11? Uh, we hear a lot about ICD-11, don't we? Um, I wonder, um, Michael, Michael Jones, any thoughts on that? Michael, you're on mute, sir. Um, just need to unmute yourself. That's the thrills and spills of being live. Not to worry, not to worry. Um, Jill, I, I've got a, while, while Michael's talking about that, I'm going to jump to a question um, that came um, about uh, your rheumatology um, from Mark uh, Banks, if I can, if I can just find it. Um, yeah, when identifying the thousands of patients that needed to be identified um, for the work you did, how did you ensure that the results, um, by that I think the patients he's referring to being identified, um, are not incorrectly identified by the data mining techniques um, on such a large scale? Absolutely, I'll try and um, answer that my best. It, it, it's not a, a process that I was heavily involved in, um, but I do have an overview of that. Um, so we were fortunate that we'd already done um, some data mining of rheumatology letters. So we had done the testing and the learning um, and looked at the output and had some confidence around the output. Um, so that had already happened. Um, getting to the list of patients that needed shielding, it was about doing that early identification and cutting down the cohort of patients that actually needed the manual clinical review. So there was a manual process in it. So once we got down um, to the smaller number of patients and had confidence because we'd already done the testing, um, it, it allowed a, a group of clinicians to actually review those patients and, and make that final call and that final decision around the need for that process. So it wasn't a completely automated process. Yeah. There was still um, a manual intervention to give that assurance level. Right. Yeah, and, and, and that QA bit's really important. But uh, a question well asked. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, can I just check, Michael Jones, are you back on with us? No, unfortunately not. How about, how about Michael Bond? I've got a question for you, sir, if you're there. Well, I'm here. Um, you can try the question if you can hear me. Ah, good. We did. No, that's, that's, that's absolutely fine. Um, I'm just going to go to... Um, 
uh, a question um, from Graham um, Ponting. Um, and he asked, uh, what about cross-mapping uh, SNOMED um, to ICD and OPCS? Um, is it useful? Um, any experience? What are, your, what, what are your thoughts on that? Okay, well, um, although I have to hold my hand up and say I am not a coder, um, and neither have I coded in anger, um, I do know that there's a lot of time and effort spent on the, the cross maps that are produced centrally uh, by NHS Digital for the National Relief Centre that map um, uh, and, and augment what we what we release in the UK that map from SNOMED uh, to uh, the, um, the the classifications ICD and OPCS and uh, yes it's a complex world in that if you have just one code and it matches to uh, just one classification then that's uh, the nice simple case. But is that useful? Well, yes, it is. And um, I, I think I saw Lele on the list of attendees um, who did a lot of work at Rotherham for um, SNOMED mapping to classifications. And if you can get the easy stuff um, out of the way and concentrate on the more complex cases and audit and look more in more detail at those, then yeah, I, I think it is useful. Okay, thanks, thanks very much. Um, uh, got a question from, uh, or, or an observation here from Donna Morgan. Thank you for a lively discussion. Some good points made. My experience in SNOGAD impl implementation uh, is the coders and information staff were invited to contribute uh, too late. And I know that um, in, in the report we produced and in um, earlier parts of our discussion, it was getting coders involved much earlier on um, in the workflows and the pathways. Um, I wonder, Jill, if you could just say a little bit more about that, because I think that's a, a real uh, key area and uh, an interest of yours, of just the, the earlier uh, yeah. involvement of those two players in the coding department. Would you just like to el elaborate a bit on that for Donna? Yeah, no, absolutely. I completely agree with Donna. Um, and it's lovely to see the comment on there. Um, unfortunately, coders are often invited in um, too late um, in the day. And I've got a personal experience of that from many, many years ago, and hopefully we've learned from that. Um, but it was a stage where we'd created a new um, admission clerking document within our EPR. Um, it actually went on to win awards. Um, but, but when we reviewed it from a coding perspective, um, a simple use of, of terminology um, around the diagnosis field, which was a structured field, um, where it had, um, oh, I can't, I can't remember what the word was, but it was a term that we weren't permitted to code within coding. Um, it was it actually, I think they used impression. Um, so it, it's on that coder list of no-nos. Um, and okay. because we're invited often quite late in, into these reviews, um, we often come across as being quite obstructive. That isn't what we are, you know, we code to standards um, and we're very passionate about our standards. Um, so that just shows that if we'd have been involved in that process a lot earlier on, we'd have been able to feedback that actually, are you sure that's the term you want to use? And if you use that, the implication for coding would mean that, that we don't have a definitive diagnosis. And that's absolutely fine if that's the intention, but it's being able to put our point across um, and just give that understanding of how that data would then be analysed by the coder and abstracted and in turn translated into a coded format. So the earlier you can be involved, I think it just um, it, it, it just makes it more collaborative. From the very early onset, everyone's got a shared goal and I think it is so, so important. Great. Well, I can, I, time, our, our Q&A time is, uh, is coming close to an end, but I think that's a really very positive note um, uh, to finish on, um, is uh, the coder's role is ever involving, huge, huge part to play, but to be part of that uh, multidisciplinary team um, right from the get-go. Um, I think that's a, a really good message to send out to everyone. Uh, suffice it to say uh, from me, I would just like to uh, rethink again um, our three uh, panelists, Michael Jones, uh, Jill Cartledge, and Michael Bond. 
Um, I hope you've all enjoyed it. It's certainly been a, um, uh, a conversation full of interesting points and topics. And um, uh, thank you very much. And uh, we'll sign up. Thank you.